Hello, my name is Mike. I'm one of the co-directors of National Young Writers Festival 2020, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to this event. It's getting hot in here. As I'm sure you're aware, we're currently living through the single most significant ecological crisis in human history. And so today we're bringing together some of the best new emerging voices in climate writing for a panel and a discussion about the ethics of climate writing, the best ways to approach it, and the best work that's being done in the field. But before we do that, rather than introduce the individual panelists, I think it would be better for you just to get a taste of their work because we're also presenting a series of readings by these people of fantastic works that they've done relating to the climate or ecology in general. I very much hope you enjoy. Hi, my name is my favorite hobby is playing piano and I'm seven years old. Well, hello there. That's me. And I grew up in the Hunter Valley, close to some mining towns. I always thought my greatest fear was normal, until I recently found out it's not. I wasn't scared of the dark, or monsters I'd seen on TV. No, my greatest fear was big holes. I see you across the room. You've been here before. You look at me, I look away. My face goes red. My heart races. You pretend not to notice. We both know the truth. I came here to get loose. I just want to be happy. Let's pretend it doesn't exist. Let's pretend together. Are you nervous? I hope we have the same definition of consent. People are staring, but I don't care. It's just you and me right now. I want to give it all to you. I leave my skin at the door. You wrap yourself around me and hinge each other. It doesn't matter. Let ourselves be free. You do old growth. You're the extremophile. I never want it to end. I'm into deep time. I'm anti-disciplinary. My legs are killing me. My arms are killing me. Let's slip into something more comfortable. Slide back into the river along the fish. I'll ungrow in front of you. Devolve me.
I'm riddled with ants. Your mantle is showing. Palm oil enema. Boiling honey jacuzzi. Capsizing trawlers. You're bleached to oblivion. Heavy metal mercury. Amyl nitrate swamp. Imploding oil rig. Resin stretched ring. Spit on my membrane. Blow up the dam. We're bare backing raw dog jackals. Superbug orgasm. Drone dick disembowelment. Flightless bird inferno. Salt cured corpse. Reverse Icarus. Scream into the pillow. You make me feel so small. The end is nigh. Don't pull out. Radioactive afterglow. Was it good for you? I just need some space. Things got weird. It's not you, it's me. I don't see myself in your future. I never meant to hurt you. Love hurts. Love hurts. Love hurts. I gave cyclones the names of my siblings just so I could pretend that we all went back home at least once. But none of us made it back for 14 years until last Christmas. I remember the first time we said goodbye to our village. I remember my grandfather, belly full of food and laughter he taught me a magic trick and promised to teach me once I came back. He never did. I think he may have forgotten or maybe five-year-old me clung onto unnecessary memories. I remember the ocean and how it would serenade those who'd listen, forming soft vows that would crash on top of each other, putting babies to sleep. I remember thinking the ocean was my home and wanting to reach the bottom. I'd swim and swim and swim. But my lungs weren't big enough for that adventure. I remember the shipwreck that kids would slide down on. It was my favourite place. Besides the beach that had sand that looked like diamonds. They say ghosts live there. I would later find out that this was true. When we came back home, we flew through a storm. It was as if home knew we were coming, splitting the sky open and crying because its children had returned. When we arrived in our village, our family hugged us till our ribs ached till our hearts were no longer sore. My cousins treated me as if I never left, catching up on years of teasing. My aunties were all prepared for our arrival. After all these years, keeping mats big enough to include us so we could sit down with them one day, listening to childhood stories whilst chewing on salty plums and ice blocks. 
I tried to talk to my family as much as I could, but my language was forced out of me, scared out of me. I cannot shapeshift back into myself. It feels like my mother tongue has disowned me. Australia once again removing children from their family. I tell them I hate them through gritted teeth with venom and honey. How dare they make me sound like them? How dare they erase my outlines and dislocate my throat with their crooked smiles and good intentions? We learn to dance again. And when our feet hit the ground, the earth sung, mimicking the beats of the drums, our limbs telling stories like our old people who were watching and our old people before them. In the morning, our feet were swollen, but salt water would take care of that. I took a tour of my home, led by my mother and my mother and my other mother, they showed me the beach, sunset pinks creeping on the horizon. The beach was much smaller. Sharks swam in ankle deep water, craving for food, both human and animal. I noticed the shipwreck was gone. They say the last storm took it ripping its roots from our shore. I noticed that the houses were closer to the shore. I noticed the different colours of the sea, not like what they used to be. The ocean looked dull and didn't sing like it used to. The ocean, the ocean is drowning and pollution and eating at the edges of our island fish are slowly disappearing and when they come back they don't taste or look the same the seasons are no longer definitive and some are slowly disappearing the heat feels different, uncomfortable and dangerous, as if it could burn you from the inside out. Everything is dying quicker, including the people. When will our deaths matter for you to care? My home is constantly changing and not because it wants to. I want to go home again, but I'm afraid my island won't be waiting for me. Very good hairdressers, by the way. My name's Janine Davies, and I run the Shoalhaven Back Clinic, which is a part of Wildlife Rescue South Coast. We're licensed under National Parks and Wildlife, and uh, the facility is located here at my home in Bomaderry. What needs to be done every day is we have to clean out every single cage, we have to scrub out the aviaries, we've got to remove the tarps, get rid of all the, the pulped up fruit, we have to change their water, we have to scrub out their buckets, we have to then cut enough food to see them through the whole day. An adult bat will take approximately 450 to 500 grams of fruit, uh, so at the moment we're looking at probably 90 to 100 kilos of fruit being cut per day.
The babies are delightful to bring up, but they're just like um, a baby. We have to feed them bottles, we give them dummies, they need to be cuddled, we brush them with, with little um, either toothbrushes or, or mascara brushes, which is basically what their mother would be doing. These little ones were all found um, on the ground down at the Bomaderry colony. So it's believed that when these little ones came in, um, because of the drought up north, um, the flying foxes then tend to started to move further down south to get the flowering gums. But that was hastened because of the fires. And um, by the time they all got down here, the mothers were obviously exhausted malnourished and therefore the babies weren't getting enough nourishment as well. Um, we've just had thousands die and we've managed to rescue about 500 or so. So this little one's still being fed a bottle, uh, it's being weaned and what will happen is that once they're weaned they go onto fruit, they then progress into the crate and then ultimately into the flight aviary where they are able to gain more strength, get their flying abilities spot on, and ultimately be returned to the wild. The problem is though, that with these fires, we're not sure what we've got to release them back into and that is going to be a major issue. Uh, we're gonna to have to discuss um, at higher levels, government le levels, what we're actually going to be able to do with these wonderful little creatures. We've had um, numerous donations from countries such as New Zealand, Singapore, uh, the UK, various places in Europe, the US, Canada, um, Portugal. Uh, most of these people have made and sent um, mama rolls, which are these wonderful little rolls. Um, so they've been sent from all over the world and we've also had a lot of financial donations. Um, the response has been heartwarming and we are ever so grateful for everybody. Um, our international following is probably bigger than that of, of the Australians. They appreciate our flying foxes more than some of our own, unfortunately. Being a wildlife carer is not cheap. We all put our hands into our own pockets um, to the tunes of many, many, many thousands of dollars. And we, there should, I believe there should be more support. There really should be more support. I have noticed that there has been some advertising of some mental health um, contacts during this time. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think there needs to be more financial support for everybody. I think we've left everything way too late. I'm deeply concerned that there's not going to be enough food uh, and that ultimately that this species will become extinct. Maybe 50 years down the track, maybe less. Without them, we are going to lose a lot of the forests and a lot of the fruit trees. And people don't seem to realise that without them, so many other species, for example, koalas eat eucalyptus, birds frequent the trees, possums, insects. It's just a myriad of, of animal species that also rely on the forests. We too, as humans, rely on the forests as well. And if they aren't pollinated, they will cease to exist. So in the future, the future generations are going to sit back and say, what did they do? Or more to the point, why didn't they do something? No lo dejemos que se apague. Sigamos iluminando más países.
el mundo en donde el capitalista neoliberal no logre apagar nuestras luces que hoy ilumina la oscuridad. I wanted to love you, but instead I was caught up in my head. Thoughts roaming wild from the endless morning of and bearing of our dead. I'm strong, but some days this hurt I can't shed. I drink the dread daily like morning coffee addiction, insomnia fed, choking on the unsaid, the thoughts of bloodshed. This is what they try to reduce us to. Hollow pain-filled skeletons, no heritage, no intelligence, surviving and nothing more. But we resist and persist through anything that seeks to destroy us. Joyous and victorious in spite of the weight, we carry our ancestors on our breastplate. Excellence and ignition, enigma and contradiction. Watch the beast. He gets fed by trauma story addiction. Licks his lips at the sight of my injuries and miseries, hungry for a narrative of hostilities and war to fill his all-consuming stomach. The beast pounces during a fragile moment, smelling my fear when I am weak, snarling double-speak, his teeth pull at my brown flesh. Spit out my hope with disdain, he revels at my pain, I close my eyes and pray for death, but there is no God and I don't die, even though I wish I would. The beast has many heads, Raytheon, BHP, Rio Tinto, British Petroleum, and so many more. Individual consumption is the myth he spits to continue the destruction. Lies and propaganda. There are 100 companies responsible for 71% of global polluting emissions. So-called peace missions open the doors to Trojan horse relationships that leave behind earth-destroying coalitions and Christian missions. You watch the tele vision. Feel the heat and envision that the world is headed for collision. An apocalypse on the horizon implies incomprehensive, unprecedented times, but for colonized peoples, our apocalypse came with the ships. And this neoliberal imperialist world has already authored the greatest dystopia ever written. Are we warriors? Resplendent, applause-deserving, articulate, indigenous descendants. Nomination-worthy, post-successful assimilation and application of colonial aspirations. Am I better in past tense, more palatable as mestiza, best reference in ecology papers written by white academics like, they used to care for the land better than today's Western modern ways. And they tell me I'm not really una india, they tell me I am mestiza, forcing their blood quantums onto me like their predecessors forced their white bodies onto my ancestors, but I am reclaiming the languages once ripped from our tongues. Next will be the land that carries the trees that nourishes our lungs. Land looted by the colonial world to uphold its patrimonial privileges, the beast pillages in all continents. With metal teeth and political chauvinism, he drinks up my blood like oil to fuel his imperialism. Fascism finds eroticism in death, consuming coltan, quartz, gold. The minerals he hoards are the stolen pieces of my spirit. This is not a metaphor. Meanwhile, forests are reduced to ashes. Lead leaks in water catchments and poisoned waterways produce GMO fish hatchments. Can't escape the boil water advisory guidelines or the cancer and infertility inclines caused by the soil left behind by uranium mines. The drugs consumed are to cope because communities continue to choke on trauma. Well, home is cloaked by toxic air from climate disaster smoke. Bespoke gentrification puts up a sign and claims woke. A child takes their life. Pipeline spills on sacred hills. Man camps brimming with violence lead to missing and murdered women. Trails of tears. We are the land, one and the same, and those responsible for this violence have names. Don't speak of past custodians in ways as if we've disappeared into our graves. We are not past tense. We are still the land. My brother's hands are the color of ochre, mine the color of sand. From West Papua to Palestine, we resist, we fight, and we stand, still caring for the land, and we will continue to do so for generations to come. Amoya Iwashka, Nonoian, Kan Noyakao, Kan Moyakao. The people are rising more than ever. With our raised fists and our hunger, intelligence as our weapon and commander, prayer and medicine anchored in our joy, brilliance and candor, we strive for excellence as we thrive and so the beast will not survive so long as we are alive.
Hi, I'm Angus. This is a piece called Pinkies. Trigger warning. Blood. It's an odd thing to read on an Instagram story. I click on, enticed by the promise of gore. It's a video of what appears to be a mass of mutated cocktail franks, fringed by tissue stained scarlet. Newborn rats, eyes and ears and mouths sealed by tight skin. My mate Max had no idea their pet rat Patty had been pregnant, and now in her cage squirms something akin to a brain trying to disassemble itself into soft pink folds. When I was a teenager, I volunteered at the zoo. There were these industrial fridges crammed with rats, snap frozen at all stages of life. Adults were thawed to dangle in front of pythons. Slender juveniles were fed to the tawny frog mouths. The keepers called the embryonic newborns pinkies. I saw them lined up on chopping boards and run through with knives, their hard and glittering bodies sliced to reveal the white of forming spines, the red and purple swirl of their guts like patterns in hard candy. By the time I convinced my boyfriend that we should adopt some of Patty's babies, there were two left from a brood of 14. One is a gentle girl with dairy cow splodges and a taste for the salt on our fingers. We call her Elizabeth. The other is sewer rat brown with the ride or die hard bitch energy to match. Not a skein of fear vibrates in her. We nickname her Pig, and the name sticks. Eight months later, summer, past midnight. I'm dehydrated and drunk and stumbling inside. The door to the girl's cage has swung open. Elizabeth quivers in the back corner. Pig is gone. After half an hour of scouring the gutter outside with my phone torch, face burning, liver purple from crying, there's a shriek from next door. A rat! Charlie! Kill it! We hightail it over the fence and find a middle-aged couple, eyes bloodshot with wine, pressed up against their barbecue as if there's a lion on the patio. A cocker spaniel is murder hunched towards the corner, and there's Pig, obliviously gnawing on a gum nut. I swoop down and grab her, sobbing with relief. We had no idea then that the gum nut was a post-coital snack. Three Saturdays after this midnight excursion, Pig flips onto her side. Something in her stomach sends a rippling bulge across the fair hair on her belly. The conclusion is clear. Pinky's incoming. We drive her to the vet for an x-ray. The vet emerges from the back, shaken. There's two fetuses in there, the vet says. One's abnormally large, she'd never be able to birth it. The other, and this is the medical term, is a monster fetus. The vet explains that monster fetus is usually observed in large mammals like cattle and humans. The skin of the embryo forms but fails to catch the internal organs. The fetus's heart, its liver, its uninflated lungs all afloat within the uterus. We have to operate now, the vet says, or she'll die. The bramble camelame is a rat-like creature, native to the northernmost island of the Great Barrier Reef. Photos on Google Images remind me of pig. They have the same tawny back and white belly, the short face and bulging black eyes. We don't know much about the melamies. A 2008 recovery plan is listed on the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment's websites. It says their ancestors probably travelled to the cave from Papua New Guinea on driftwood and that they populate crab burrows and feed on succulents. There's a section of the plan about the impact of climate change on the melamies. It reads, The likely consequences of climate change, including sea level rise and increase in the frequency and intensity of tropical storms, are unlikely to have any major impact on the survival of the bramble cane melamies in the life of this plant. By the next year, 2009, the bramble cane melamies were gone, all drowned in a supercharged storm. The first mammal declared extinct due to climate change. I think of Pig and what she endured during her escape. Her hours in streets lined with poison traps, the owls, the cars, the cats, the cocker spaniels and drunk neighbours, the street rat that fucked her, a monster fetus and a surgeon's scalpel. The fact she survived it all. I think of her clinging to a piece of driftwood, the colour of bone, senses overwhelmed by salt and the tide colossal under her tiny hands. Her first night in a new home more sandbank than island, using dead turtle shells as cover from hungry seabirds. I think of her rolling onto her back and giving birth within a warm, sandy burrow, pinkies. I think of the seawater that rushed in and dragged her babies out, their tiny bodies racked with cold and terror, their mother drowning, their half-formed fists grasping at each other and then going rigid, clutching a pinky-sized handful of a vast and seething ocean. The bramble came Melamy was the first of our class to go extinct because of climate change. But I look at Pig 
and I know a rat like her will outlive us all. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ange Collins, and I'm going to be reading an excerpt of my short play, Huge Indoor Plant Warehouse Sale. So this monologue comes at the climax of the play, I guess. Um, it's where our protagonist, Ash, confronts their boss, Nina, at um, Forest & Co's weekend warehouse sale. They're confronting Nina about their motivations for starting their uh, indoor plant business. So here we go. You're so full of shit, Nina. And so is this whole thing. Who wants to listen to shit remixes of Triple J songs in a hot as fuck warehouse while they buy overpriced cacti? Not me. Who wants to line up to elbow other people to get the biggest rip silas they can? Not me. Who wants to be served by a snot-nosed 21-year-old TAFE student who has no idea what they're doing, or a whiny grown-up horse girl trying to be trendy so hard it's painful? Just because you could set up a Facebook event with pleasant graphic design, you think you're entitled to call yourself Head Haughty or whatever the fuck your made-up title is? You don't have a unique baby business. You have a glorified scam machine that tricks poor millennials and rich Gen X fucks with children named Archer into insulating their homes with the plant equivalents of Birkenstocks and linen dungarees. This is some serious shit, Nina. People are scared right now. People I know are scared to death. And you're waltzing around profiting off that. Profiting off nature guilt. Students who are so terrified of the heat apocalypse that they're surrounding themselves with leafy carbon neutral wadding. People that have two SUVs and fly to Europe every other year, but at least they can brag to their rosé mummies about how good their pillia looks. The polar bears are all dead, but look how beautifully my plants hang in the natural light. If this thing burns to the ground, bury my string of pearls and chain of hearts around my sarcophagus and put on some cold play as my children slowly suffocate in the smoke. What is possible to say about climate change that hasn't already been screamed by someone much better before me? It took a literal pandemic to knock it off the top spot of things we need to fix right now. And if you're watching this, you're probably well aware of just how dire the situation is. So what do we do? Even as writers with a platform and a voice, it seems that we have limited ability to steer the ship to climate safety. What can you do when the most productive climate activists are attending protests, writing letters to governments, getting arrested, and Australia still has per capita emissions higher than the US, China, and India? It all feels pretty hopeless. But the overwhelming feeling of hopelessness that I know a lot of us are feeling isn't helpful. So today, we're not talking about the bad news. I'm going to show you some of the ways the people of Australia are making large-scale differences to the makeup of our energy. I've been writing articles about climate change since I became a science journalist, and among all the important but devastating climate headlines like hottest year on record, or Great Barrier Reef die off, or the extinction of a species, we don't get to appreciate the people who are making a real difference. Scott Morrison, Tony Abbott, Malcolm Turnbull, be damned. The first people I'm giving a shout out to is South Australia. In 2018, it was second in the world behind only Denmark in total share of electricity generated from wind and solar. While I'm recording this, they have 30% wind, 40% solar, and unfortunately gas makes up the rest. And although unsurprisingly the system was put in under a Labor government, the Liberal government that's been in power since 2018 has kept it mostly intact. Tasmania is likely to be the first state in Australia with 100% renewable power by 2022, the bulk of which is hydro, but again, we'll take what we can get. And the ACT has 100% renewable power. Well, it pays for renewable investments around the country for every watt of power it uses. It's not just completely running off rooftop solar or anything, but that would be cool. So, this, so the little states and territories have done it, or at least are significantly on their way there. Despite the federal government's complete lack of investments into renewable energy and electric or even hydrogen cars, there is still stuff happening in other states too. For example, in what feels like a bygone age, last year I went to the Woodford Folk Festival, and one of the speakers I got to see was a guy who was building the biggest solar farm in Queensland. 
The name of the project is Solar Q, and they're currently building an absolutely enormous solar farm and battery storage facility near Gympie, with the intention to eventually supply power to 15% of southeast Queensland. But it's not alone. Deep inside rural New South Wales, the equally ginormous Lemondale solar farm is having the finishing touches placed onto it. It's a 349 megawatt facility, and when it's completed, it'll be the biggest solar farm in Australia, at least until Gympie is up and running. What's really cool here is that these are viable economic projects. Solar power is a similar price to coal power, and it's only going to get cheaper. So this is not the last solar farm you'll see popping up around the country. Okay, finally, we've talked a lot about renewable power, but we really don't want to be traveling around in gas guzzling vehicles. Everyone knows all about electric cars thanks to everyone's weird uncle, Elon Musk. But electric cars aren't the only ones on the market. There's also hydrogen. Now, hydrogen is a bit complicated to explain, but imagine it's like a big unlimited use battery. You can form it using renewable energy and then happily store it until it needs to be used. Daniel Roberts and the rest of the team at the CSIRO Hydrogen Energy Systems Future Science Platform is working on getting renewable hydrogen cheap enough that it's a viable option for Australia. I spoke to him for a story a couple of months ago, and he honestly thinks that we could be a world leader in this stuff. We have lots of space for renewable power, and hydrogen can easily be shipped overseas to places like Japan, where they really want to be using less fossil fuels but have less space. We might feel helpless as riders. But people out there in the world are doing things. And although we can't ignore the bad things, and there is a lot of them, don't hesitate to report on the good things too. Hell, I know we could use the morale boost. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this panel uh, on climate writing. It's getting hot in here as part of the National Young Writers Festival. I hope you enjoyed those readings. Um, just a quick note, Malika, unfortunately, will not be able to join us, but the rest of the people you just heard from are here to discuss climate writing. Um, before we kick off, I'd just like to acknowledge that I am broadcasting from the lands of the Gadigal of the Eora Nation. Their lands were never ceded, uh, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, my name is Angus Dalton. I'm one of the co-editors of Sweaty City, a new climate journal from Sydney. And I'm joined by an absolutely amazing gang of climate writers and artists. And we'll just uh, cycle through and introduce ourselves now. Hi, I'm Ian. Um, I'm an experimental artist and a playwright. Um, and I'm on Gadigal Country in the Eora Nation. Hi, I'm Jacinta. Um, I'm a science journalist at Science Alert and I do freelancing work on the side. Um, I am on the nation of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Hi, my name is Izzy Phillips. I'm a comedian and climate communicator and I'm broadcasting from Gadigal Land. Hi, I'm Angela. I'm on Gadigal Country. I'm also an editor of Sweaty City and the digital, digital producer over at Australian Geographic. I'm Ange, um, I'm a playwright, and I'm also broadcasting from Gadigal Country. Um, yeah. All righty. Thanks, everyone. Um, so we have an impending climate apocalypse, and I think now they've given us about 11 years to bring everybody on board to solve the damn thing and also a little pandemic to deal with just to keep things interesting. Uh, so we're going to talk about the ways in which writing could hopefully bring more people on board so we don't all burn in a fiery climate apocalypse. Um, I'm going to start with a question that I think uh, we should all potentially ask more uh, in regards to the climate crisis, and that is how are we all feeling about the climate apocalypse impending and the climate crisis more generally? Um, and then if we could all sort of go into how we go about uh, integrating climate communication into our work, I think that would be awesome. Um, Ian, let's start with you. How are you feeling broadly about the climate crisis and um, how do you incorporate climate communication into your work? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> how am I feeling? Uh, um, I don't know. Um, I usually, uh, within the work that I make, which is uh, both playwriting in a more traditional form and more experimental kind of like immersive participatory works, um, I sort of, I take, I take the viewpoint, um, 
like you said, Angus, that, uh, you know, we have 11 years and this sort of stuff, but I actually kind of take a viewpoint that, you know, uh, it's happening now and it's around us now and we're sort of in the mid-apocalypse of it all. And so a lot of my practice is about working in that mid-apocalypse and what that means, sort of the queer ecology, the bizarreness of it all and how that is is changing and affecting us. Um, and I probably take a bit more of a, like, it's like the work that I make is humorous and things like that, um, but this might sound a bit depressing or something, but I, I definitely see the work as a as making sort of pal- palliative spaces for audiences. And so, you know, we're, we're here, we're in the mid-apocalypse and, um, you know, there's no, I don't believe there's any going back. And so it's about how we live now, how we adapt and how we um, can work together to sort of um, care, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to ask, one of your pieces of work is called Ecosexual Bathhouse. Can you explain what that is for people who don't know? Yeah, sure. Um, The Ecosexual Bathhouse um, is a sex club for the entire ecosystem. And so that work was a big sort of multi-chambered experience. It was set up in sort of uh, the setting and the sonography of a gay sauna, but you could kind of go through and have all your uh, greenest desires met. Fantastic. I hope um, it's still open uh, despite the pandemic. I'd love to visit. (laughs) Um, Jacinta, do you want to give us um, an insight into your work and how you're feeling about the climate crisis? Yeah, I was going to say, like, I would like to go to that sauna. Um, (laughs) I think we need it more than ever. (laughs) <laughs> in the particular pandemic. Um, so my writing is very um, science-based, very journalistic-based, but I have done some work in the past um, doing that kind of longer form and trying to, like, look at the future of, like, whether we can or not get this under control. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the opposite view and say that it's never too late to start. The sooner we start, the better. But anything we do now is super important and it's not like I I know we talk about kind of cliffs and like there's a point where like it's only going to get worse but if we are able to get to a point like yeah I feel like anytime we start is going to be better for everybody and the less um, damage there's going to be in the future um yeah, my I'm um, probably one of my favorite pieces that um I've written was actually a fiction story which I was allowed to write for my work which is really cool. Um and it was a letter to the future and it was about what the like, this very optimistic letter about what happened when we did manage to solve well like we did actually lower our carbon emissions and we were able to um get things under control to some extent. And it's called A Letter from the Future and I really like it. So I'm hopeful still. Maybe that's a silly thing to be, but I'm I'm still hopeful that maybe we can, that with, that with all of the damage that's happening, we can still make things work. Think absolutely, that. absolutely, especially with talented science journalists like yourself. Um, there's absolutely reasons to stay hopeful. Thank you, Jacinda. Izzy, do you want to give us an insight into your work? Yeah, I think how I feel really goes day to day. Um, Some days I feel really hopeful and inspired and energetic and then other days I feel really despondent and hopeless. But I think kind of honouring those range of emotions is really important when making work around the climate. Uh, Most of my work is comedic. I'm a comedian and I like to look at kind of localised climate issues within an Australian context. Uh, I like to do this because a lot of my humour is kind of like based in, you know, Australiana. So, um, yeah, finding ways that we can look or think about different things that might seem like really big but kind of distilling them down through just kind of talking about them or joking about them or dressing up as a big piece of coal or um, different things like that. Sounds sexy. Thank you. (laughs) Um, Angela, uh, what do you do and how do you incorporate climate communication into that? 
Yeah, so I'm very similar to Jacinta in that, like, I come from a very much, like, journalistic background. Um, With Australian Geographic, obviously, we've been covering climate change since, like, the 1980s, so there's kind of, like, a long history of climate change coverage there. Um, And I'm really proud to be, like, a part of an organisation that has done that for a long time, but, again... Obviously, you know, if climate change journalism was effective or, you know, um, or if we'd kind of made way with climate change, well, more so if it had been effective, we probably wouldn't be in the position that we're in right now. And so I guess like a lot of what I work with is like how can we improve on what people have done in the past and how can we kind of make climate change a little bit more like yeah, like palatable to people, how do we get people to listen? Um, basically, I yeah, every day I'm thinking about different ways that climate change stories can cut through What rather than, and obviously working in a news organisation slash magazine, you're getting constant feedback on what works and what doesn't, what gets what people read and what they don't. So that's been really, really interesting to watch. Like, for example, I'm always looking at, you know, how people click on how climate change is going, to, is going to affect sport as opposed to how climate change will affect, like, the Great Barrier Reef. So that's all, like, really interesting to watch. Um, but then obviously in Making Sweaty City, for me, that was kind of like solving the issue between, you know, I didn't want to... I didn't like kind of the climate change communication that focused on um, like the individual and how the individual can make their life more sustainable, um, you know, like grab a keep cup and, you know, your job done kind of stuff. I, I really like just hate that. Um, and then obviously looking at it from a global perspective, you know, the ice caps are melting and all that kind of jazz, that makes people feel like it's a distant issue, it's away from them. And so my thing is very much like community-based journalism that talks about or city-based journalism that talks about how, you know, your city is currently being impacted and, you know, how you are seeing it in your everyday life and things that are around you that you love are changing but you may not just, you may not be recognising or, or your eyes aren't capable of actually seeing that type of change. Um, so, yeah, I guess like that's where my focus is as a writer. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Angela. Um, Ange Collins, can you give us an insight into where you're at with the climate crisis and how we communicate it? Hello. Um, Very happy to be one of two Angels on this (laughs) Um, panel. I actually had this moment where in 2018, I remember it was when the UN report came out that said, you know, 12 years or whatever, and I had this, like, extremely visceral and months long um phase of anxiety um climate anxiety and I think a lot of other people had that around that time as well and that was when I decided to pivot my playwriting practice into dealing with the climate crisis directly um in terms of like my view on things um an expert I am not um I do obviously have have an interest in the science behind everything. Um, so I'm kind of like in the middle of Ian's perspective and Jacinta's perspective where I don't know where we're at, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, so I really tend to focus on my own personal response to um, to the everyday things that are occurring around me. Um, uh, and I think that the climate crisis is just everything. So I think it's just like this lens that I inherently used to explore different aspects of of you know life as a human it's not this big problem it's just kind of this like glaze over over everything else in this goddamn, <laughs> this goddamn world. world that's what it is at the moment <laughs> far out um victoria we missed you from the introductions if you're online this is the perils of uh zoom the zoom land um if you're there do you want to introduce us and give us um an introduction to your work Hello there. Um, sorry about all the technical okay. issues. So you can't see me, but I'm smiling and I'm waving at you all. <laughs> and I'm speaking to you today from unceded Aranda territories. Um, I myself am born in Anahuac, which is also known as Mexico. I come from Wijadika and Nahua lineage. 
and I've been living here for about seven years. Um, my work, I would say, revolves around speaking to my own identity, speaking to folks who have been casted away or thrown out from or marginalized from the dominant systems, folks who exist in different realities to privilege, and I guess what that looks like across difference and across different experience. Um, I guess that's kind of what I try to speak to. And it's mainly poetry. Sometimes I do other stuff, but yeah, I'm, I'm still very much learning and figuring it out myself. So, Aren't we all, Victoria? Thank you. Um, I guess the biggest thing that comes uh, out of, you know, you know, trying to sell a climate story is that it, it, it is at the best of times a bloody hard sell. And at the moment, um, obviously, most of humanity is sort of embroiled in a seemingly more urgent uh, global catastrophe. Um, I'll just let whoever wants to jump in um, speak on this, but do you actually think that climate stories are as hard to sell as they are stereotypically made out to be? Um, and how do we how do we keep people engaged in, in climate stories? And if no one jumps in, I'll pick on someone. I could speak to that a little bit. Um, I guess I guess this touches on the other question as well. And on this one is that it depends who you're speaking to when it when we discuss and like who it touches and who it doesn't touch. And I think this idea that the panic or anxiety around climate is something that is emerging is a very colonial idea because speaking from our experience as people in Anahuac, we have been grieving the loss of our land for 500 years. And we talk about how this world is now turning apocalyptic and it's, it's ending. And we fail to recognize that for indigenous peoples, the world started ending at contact, at first contact with colonization. And we have already been living in dystopia. We have already been living in post-apocalypse and we are under this current neo neoliberal imperialism, we already are existing within the greatest dystopia ever authored. And I think it's really important when we speak about the climate to recognize that this is not anything new for us. We've been watching the desecration of our rivers, of our lands for hundreds of years now. And that grief has lived with us now for multiple generations to where they can coin this term, transgenerational trauma, et cetera. But um, yeah, I think it's important to highlight that. And when we talk about how do we get people to care? Most people don't care until it starts affecting them personally. Um, but there's a lot of people that do care because it has affected us personally for hundreds of years now. Absolutely. Victoria, when you look at sort of like the art landscape and the writing landscape, this might be an obvious question, but do you think that perspective is being, uh, is it at the forefront enough? Um. I don't know if I could speak to that because I guess it depends enough for who and what's possible because it's quite painful to write about and we're asking people to put their trauma on the front lines um, and to expose their trauma for the benefit and consumption of the wider public. But I think that there's a lot of new art emerging and it's really beautiful to see and I see it more and more in the art space and that's really inspiring and really hopeful and such a beautiful thing to see. Absolutely. Um, and as we talk about this, I wanted to ask um, you, Jacinta and Angela, as journalists, um, what are you actually seeing? What are people paying attention to at the moment? Like, is it true to say that people don't click on climate stories as often as they do, say, you know, cute, cuddly animal stories? Like, is that true from your perspective, Jacinta? Yeah, we get some weird stories, like a story that we might not think is going to do well. A, a really good example would be the Egyptian coffins a couple of days ago. There's 13 unopened ones um, and people were very invested in whether they should be opened or not, which, I mean, is totally fair, but um, it, it's an interesting point that I think it is maybe the, the idea that, like, whether we don't know, like, have we been oversaturated with this kind of content? We've been talking about it since the 80s. We've been talking about it long before that, really. And whether it is something that people go, 
I've already heard about this. I don't want to hear about it. I know what's already happening. I, I you know, it's happening already. I don't, I don't care. And so how we are able to get people, even if they know what's going on, to actually be able to change their behaviour or like lobby their government or whatever it's going to be to be able to, to make this happen, um, I think is really important. I don't think I have the answer. If I did, I feel like we'd be in a better place. <sighs> but maybe, I don't know. What about you, Angela? I feel like I, I'd go back to something Ange Collins said and it's basically like the way I look at it, at it is like, yes, Fluffy animals do do so much better than most things. So the way I look at it, look at the content that I produce, I think, okay, if that's what works, then I'm going to apply a climate lens to that. So you'll find that like most stories on Australian Geographic or frankly like um, A Sweaty City as well, um, they're constantly applying a climate change lens to whatever topic like we happen to cover. If it's a story about um, you know, like a particularly cool fish or something like that. The end of the article is, oh, and the conservation status of this fish, yada, 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 and like where it stands in terms of um, projects, that, conservation projects that are supporting it. So I think that's a big deal. Like I don't think the be all and end all is that all oh, people don't read it. There are ways to imbue it into stories that aren't necessarily direct climate change stories, which is what I found is really effective. Yeah, absolutely. I'm interested to hear from the writers who are more performance based as well. Like, do you ever feel because obviously a lot of your writing as a stand up comic Izzy and as playwrights and Jan Ian, um, do you ever feel this feeling of like, ha, I've got these people in a room, they can't go anywhere. Now I'm going to like blast them with climate communication. Um, like, what what sort of elements of performance do you think allows you to address some of the, the problems of climate communication? Um, Izzy, do you want to have a stab at answering that? Yeah, I I think there is definitely a part of that. Like, you know, if you're like doing a comedy room and everyone before you has just talked about like dating and all this kind of stuff and then you get up and you start talking about climate change, people are like, what? Like just really not expecting that. And I find that's something that can be really an exciting way to get people engaging with climate communication is in a way that they weren't necessarily expecting when they were necessarily expecting it, thinking about it in a different way that they hadn't really thought about it before. Um, and I think that for me is how, you know, climate communication can really hit the nail on the head or kind of can, you know, if you, you're taking these lens and you're putting it onto different things that people haven't necessarily heard before. Yeah, absolutely. What's your hit rate on a climate joke? Are people capable of laughing at the concept of the climate apocalypse? I think so. I think it all comes back to like, you know, comedy is all about relatability and it's funny if you kind of, if you relate to it. So it's, climate change is kind of like this hyper object, right? Like it's so big and vast and complicated that we can't actually understand we can't like we just can't understand we can't fathom what it's like so you know you just take these like little bits from popular culture or little things and then you intertwine little bits and you able to communicate a, a bigger message that's localized to their own experience rather than kind of you know the ice caps are melting well they're so far away how does this impact me right now you know Absolutely. Yeah. We always talk about that with Sweaty City. That was sort of the reason we started the mag, like Angela Heathcote was saying before, um, in terms of like, you know, taking climate change from this Arctic saga or like atmospheric thing. Um, and, you know, telling the stories of climate change through people that were walking down the street and, you know, the fruit bats flying overhead. That's absolutely our ethos with Sweaty City as well. So that totally makes sense to me. Um, and Collins, how do you feel about using theatre in particular as a vehicle for climate communication? Yeah, wow. Um, I think um, you can definitely have, um, you know, elements of the Arctic saga um, just like uh, kind of be front and centre or um, I think uh, which and, and, you know, you've got that thing of um, people trying to solve it in the space of like this hour-long fringe show um, and I just feel like that is really hard to do. I'm not saying it's impossible but like I have seen I have seen um, some some train wrecks of shows um, because it is this hyper object, as you say, Izzy. It's like so hard to fathom, and I don't know if the role of theatre is to solve climate change, but I do think its job is to elicit responses, whether that be like a, a response that 
an audience member is expecting or a response that an audience member has never before experienced. Um, like I think um, to echo again what Izzy said, um, there's an important role for comedy in climate change and I think there's like an important role for just really left of centre, wackadoo um, genres of climate change and climate climate communication. Like imagine feeling like not to like segue into Ian's work but like horny about climate change or imagine feeling like um, uh, like grumpy about climate change or sleepy climate change. Like I don't know what sleepy climate change would look like but I think that there's um, the role of theatre, especially for like just my practice, is to just have the climate communications kind of as this layer um underneath whatever else I like my brain dreams up so it's um it's definitely a priority but it's not this thing that I am dedicated to solving through the power of my own art because I think that that's just going to be a nightmare for me and everyone else involved <laughs> yeah that's a smart yeah smart way of going about it for sure um in terms of like the responses that you want to provoke from your climate communication Ian what what are they? What are your priorities when you when you create a piece of um of climate performance or nature related performance? What responses are you trying to evoke in your audience members? Um. Well, I guess it's it's two separate things, really. And again, they're separated by the immersive experimental work and like this the the play within the black box. Um, because they're two very separate things to me. Uh, I guess I, um, I guess most of what I try to do is activate an audience, get the audience to be involved in the exploration, um, in, in not solving, but participating and being a part of the problem and staying with the trouble in that sense. And so it's, you know, as Victoria was saying before, she was talking about um, also different communities and things like that. And I think, you know, I look at it through a very um, queer community lens and that's also a community the, a community that's experienced its, its several different types of apocalypse as well. And so there's ways there, I think, of um, using and working with that community to show possibly a more general audience or a mainstream audience or their peers a way to adapt or live together in that way. But I think in a playwriting sense, in a more traditional sense, I'm a bit similar to Ange. Like you just can't go in there and go like, here's the melting ice cap. You just can't. So it has to be a bit more, um, a bit more subtle, I think, um, in that way. And so usually my work from that side, like, is – like Angers has the stuff underneath it, but probably talks about anything opposite to um to the crisis. But it's just there underneath it and holds it there in that way. Because again, the characters in those works yeah, get absolutely. By the hyper object. Um, and just to pull a phrase out of that discussion, I think "horny for climate change" should absolutely be a panel of the 2021 National Young Writers Festival. Um, someone make a note of that. Thank you so much. Um, Victoria, similar question. What, uh, what responses are you trying to evoke with your work or, and what responses do you want to feel when you read a piece of, say, poetry about, um, the climate crisis? When it comes to what type of responses I'm hoping for, I guess, I guess what I could do is give an example of what I don't want. I wouldn't want to expect a response from anybody because as I said it's personal and everyone's going to have their own reaction so I wouldn't want to hope for a response but what I don't want and what would makes me really hurt I would say if I'm being honest is when you speak to a piece or when if I'm the audience in the piece of someone with uh, that I'm in solidarity with and I hear this response is when I don't know, we call it, my friends and I call it the garden party response. And there's an episode in Boondocks where Huey gets up on stage in front of a bunch of rich people and he does this amazing spiel and everyone starts clapping and saying how amazing he is and how articulate he is and how well-read he is, but they're not really actually taking in what he's trying to say and he's really frustrated in that moment. Um, 
And what really, what I don't want from my work and what I don't want from work of others that I'm in solidarity with is that response, that response where it's tokenized or where it's kind of put on a pedestal as, wow, you're so amazing for putting yourself out there like that. But really folks are not actually taking it in. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's an answer to the question. It's, it's quite personal, I guess, because when we talk about climate change, we're starting to talk about the effects on our physical bodies. And we're starting to talk about hmm, how to put it, I guess, like the air quality is getting bad and the water is running out and all these sort of things. But there's so much more to it that has, as I said earlier, already been happening for so long. And I particularly want to highlight that when we speak about the climate as artists that are of culturally diverse backgrounds, we, in first world countries, we have that privilege of making jokes about it or taking it on with a safety that whatever we put on stage is going to be received, period, whether at, at no cost to our safety other than maybe our relative fame or whatever. Um, but for example, there has been over 164 killings of environmental and land defenders in eight, 2018 alone. A lot of those people were artists. A lot of those people were journalists. Mexico, the country I come from, Anahuac, has the highest rate of murder environmentalists. My family is refugees because of environmental work. We've had attempts on our lives as well. Um, there's so many you know, minings and extravasis industries are responsible for the highest level of killings of people. Australia is awarded these privileges because it's the mines that are based here that go into other countries like Mexico. There's Australian mines in Mexico, like West Papua, Timor, and countries in the continent of Africa, where these killings happen to artists like us who don't have the privilege of being protected by the first world. Um, and that's, I guess, the more state-sanctioned violence. There's an amazing book called Confessions of an Economic Hitman that speaks to this stuff. Highly recommend it. But also the connection between climate grief and the lack of expression, because a lot of folks are not given the opportunities to express their art and express their pain. That comes with, with this. So, for example, in the Kimberleys, the suicide rate is seven times the national average and it's also the place that has one of the highest concentrations of mines in Australia. In 2013 there was a small study done that folks from Brazil, I apologize in advance that I can't phonetically say their name properly, but the Guarani Kiowa people have a 30 times are 30 times four 34 more times more likely to suicide linked to the destruction of their ancestral lands. Um, yeah, I guess talking about the response we want is maybe for these things to be heard. In Canada, the missing and murdered Indigenous woman, that's a campaign there, which they're doing some beautiful art, some beautiful songs. Um, a Tribe Called Red speaks to them. Snotty Nose Red Kids speaks to them. They're amazing musical artists, as well as many spoken word poets and visual artists, they're currently speaking to the pain of the women that are lost in Canada and the women that go missing or are found murdered are predominantly around man camps, which are like the labor camps of the mines. And the trail of tears is found off of mine sites. And so this violence towards First Nations people that quite literally takes our lives is connected to the resource extraction industry. And those who speak out uh, against it, mainly as artists, are the ones that suffer the most and don't have that privilege too. Or they, they do it knowing that they're not safe. Um, so it's a bit of a segue, but I guess when I talk about, or when I think about what response I would like, I guess maybe just to be heard because I have that privilege of speaking to that in ways that my other relations don't. And I think it's so important to acknowledge that our platforms are a privilege. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think you've really illustrated how serious and urgent this problem is, Victoria, um, especially for, for people without um, the, privilege, the privileges that a lot of people on this panel have. 
you actually reminded me of the work of, um, in an Australian context, a fantastic First Nations activist called Bruce Shillingsworth who describes the sort of effects of the drought and water mismanagement and water theft as a second genocide of Indigenous people in Australia. Um, so, yeah, how did, um, to throw that open, how does everyone feel about coming to the climate crisis from the particular perspective of um, privilege that they do? I always think about this in terms of, like, I actually sort of sometimes think of, like, being able to do climate communication as a little bit of a privilege sometimes because a lot of people don't actually have the privilege to think about anything other than being safe and being fed on a day-to-day basis. Um, so does anyone, have, does anyone have any thoughts about that and how they might sort of mitigate the privilege that they approach their work within? Totally. It is um, It is a huge privilege to just be, you know, ha- even having this, this discussion on this panel um, and, um, and to be able to think about the climate crisis through this personal lens of, you know, just me as like this random white chick in Sydney. Um, and to be able to, you know, like pitch that to different bodies and have these connections and stuff. Um, so I totally hear, hear you, Victoria. So thank you for bringing that perspective. Um, I think it also speaks to um, this, uh, this like dread that I have, which is like the out of control dread and just like the um, how embroiled like the climate crisis is in all of these different huge knotted systems that um, that are just like so scary to think about and so um, so deep in like you know late capitalism is a chugging along and you know colonialism and even the Black Lives Matter movement and the Indigenous Lives Matter movements um, here in Australia as well. It's all um, one and the same and it's um it's very easy to feel hopeless and and unheard and um it's a big conversation in the theater community about you know it's all well and good to have that garden party response at the theater but like fuck like how can we can we actually elicit any any changes in behavior and any changes in people's perspectives yeah absolutely and on that i think now would be a good time to talk about people we think who are doing climate communication right and people who aren't necessarily just getting that garden party response um, that's such a that's such a great and useful phrase, Victoria. Um, does anyone want to jump in with a piece of climate communication that they think is really hitting the nail on the head? Yeah, I wanted to. I was thinking about this beforehand. The piece that I wanted to highlight is by Bianca Negrady, a insane science communication juggernaut in Australia, and she wrote a piece recently called "The Day Australia Burned," and it is really powerful it's on wired it's a really interesting piece on just like she lives in the blue mountains and so she was very very close to the fires um earlier this year feels like a lifetime ago (laughs) but um so she's been writing about that and it becomes this really interesting shared experience um and just the fact that she was so close to it but is still able to write this piece um of still really journalistic content it's not it's not a you know first person piece or anything like that but it's just really powerful and I would yes I concur I read that it's fantastic um Izzy what about a piece of climate communication from your perspective that really nailed it something that I really enjoyed was the BBC podcast Forest 404 um Often when I'm looking or engaging with climate work, it is more in a news context. Whenever I can find some climate fiction, I love to sink my teeth into it. And it's a a podcast set in kind of a world post-climate change called The Rapture. And it's about this woman who kind of discovers the old world and finds like trees and, and sounds of birds and the way it's crafted is really beautiful. But along with that, it also has pod talks, which explains the science behind the the podcast as well as soundscapes that accompany and also influenced the podcast so it's got lots of juicy climate terms in there can confirm i binged that in two days incredible (laughs) it's really great sounds fantastic angela heathcote what about you 
Um, my big recommend is I actually just finished The Carbon Club by Marion Wilkinson, obviously like a, con- a totally seasoned environmental journalist all the way back to the 70s. And um, I always um, find it a little confusing, particularly in the Australian context, understanding how the hell we got so bogged down in this country when it comes to climate change politics. And this is kind of the view from the Howard years to right now. So it's kind of this huge political look at all the policies and all the kind of, um, uh, you know, maybe otherwise minor players who have this kind of actually major part in why we're still stuck in the mud when it comes to solving climate change. Fantastic. Ian, what about you? Yeah, um, I've been, uh, I just finished a book called um, The Animals in That Country by Laura Jean McKay, and um, that uh, that's a really playful book, and it's um, you know it just was recently released um, during the pandemic, and it's about a pandemic, and the work is uh, follows basically uh, one character as they travel around Australia, and they um, the rest of the nation is suffering from a zoo flu, in which they start to understand non-human creatures, um, starting off from you know. Uh, the dog and the cat all the way through to the whale and the worm. And so, yeah, it's a really beautiful, playful kind of work that I think it touches on a lot of things without, again, just kind of holding up and being here's, here's the crisis. Yes, I read that and it sort of struck me as like a Dr. Doolittle if it was like a horrible acid trip. It was amazing. And Collins... Hello. Um, just to make it theatrical, um, I will say David Finnegan, um, his plays Kill Climate Denies and You're Safe Till 2024 are two excellent examples of bingeable theatre that you actually want to sit through. Um, and I, just for some horny um, climate theatre stuff, I would say um, people doing excellent work are Pretty Grumble, and um, there's also this wacky lady called Annie Sprinkle who um, is just wild and like constantly inspirational to me. Um, and the she's ecosexuals just uniting. <laughs> the manifesto. Read it. <laughs> um, Gloria, what are some pieces of artists that you recommend? Definitely, I've mentioned them already once, but the Snotty Nose Res Kids. I would absolutely recommend as amazing artists that speak to the intersections of climate and race. I would also recommend some young climate warriors. So there's Helena Gualinga, who's from Ecuador. She's really amazing and does some really staunch speaking. And also Masaka Looking Horse from Grand River, Ontario, Canada. She's also a really powerful speaker and community organizer um and yeah i think off the top of my head these are the people that come to mind um i wasn't ready for that question and i'm really bad at referencing people it's like one of those things people and words i just lose that but definitely check those few out they sound fantastic. I know it's annoying when people ask you for book recommendations and every book you've ever read flies out of your head. I totally get it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I will use this opportunity to recommend a fantastic climate magazine called Sweaty City. <laughs> in Australia. And um, also I read a really beautiful piece in the monthly by a climate scientist actually named Joelle Gerges. I think that's her last name. And um It was sort of about, she's on the IPCC and I think she was part of that paper that prescribed us 12 years to sort our shit out in terms of the climate crisis. Um, And she wrote about it in parallel, it's like a metaphorical parallel with a doctor breaking to her that her dad had had this massive brain hemorrhage and showing her um, the x-ray that just showed this big black sort of blob on her father's brain essentially. Um, And she just sort of wrote about how the doctor was like told her all the facts and was very like clear eyed and compassionate with the truth of what it was. And I thought it was just such a beautiful piece of climate writing and and reflected really beautifully on how we need to communicate about what's going on um, with clear eyed compassion that doesn't hide from the truth, um, but keeps that human element. It's really fantastic. 
Um, so I think that's all we have time for. I think um, wines have run out and laptops are dying. So um, <laughs> thank you so much, um, Ian, Jacinta, Izzy, Angela, Ange and Victoria and the National Young Writers Festival are hosting this. Um, we'll see you next year, 2021, for Horny for Climate Change, I guess. <laughs> have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Keep it in the ground. <laughs> see ya.